welcome to Guts, Passion and Winning, a show where we connect with the people who have the courage to walk off the beaten path, people driven by conviction, people who intend to succeed in their mission. I'm Anika Chikarmane and we are joined today by Ms. Geetanjali Rajamani. Ms. Geetanjali Rajamani is the COO and co-founder of Pharmazin. Pharmazin is an app that lets you grow and harvest your own fresh, chemical-free food at a community farm for a monthly fee. Uh, hello, Ms. Geetanjali. Hello, Anika. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, too. So, starting with a rather basic question, okay. what's the core essence of your business? Okay. So, the core essence of it all is basically to eat healthy and safe food, uh, which is so, uh, sadly, it's so scarce uh, these days to find really food that you can trust. Uh, even the food that we buy... Um, online or or in organic shops isn't really organic they just brand it as organic but uh, isn't organic when we did our research we found that about 95 percent of stuff that they sell as organic is all coming from chemical farms so we were quite alarmed at these numbers and we wanted to uh, you know grow safe food uh, for ourselves and for others so that's how it really started off and so the core essence of it all is that to to basically give access to um, healthy and safe food for all. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me a little about how it happened in the beginning? Okay, okay. So, so basically, um, we, we were trying to move to uh, being as chemical free uh, as possible in our diets, uh, via things like composting, buying green stuff, uh, stuff like that. So it all started that way. And, uh, And then uh, I used to have a small kitchen garden Mm -hmm. um, and we used to grow something, but it was just not enough. Uh, The space that is there in our houses is not enough. So we planned on renting a small space and then tried to grow stuff on our own. And we realized that after about three to four months of growing, we realized that it is very possible uh, for a family of four to sort of survive in a 600 square feet. Uh, space you know the, uh, from the vegetables that you get from a 600 square feet space and uh, so that's how it all started off and uh, I run another company called uh, Green My Life uh, that was founded about four years back so in that we used to reach out to urban gardeners so uh, a lot of urban gardeners that I was meeting would say that you know I wish I had the space to grow my own food but unfortunately I live in apartments or we don't have real uh, enough space so it would be great if we had a service like that so that's that's how it's slowly the idea sort of got seeded in our minds and we started that Mm -hmm. and what are some events that led to your business's growth over time this could be in the form of accelerators speed bumps okay so uh, we started our business so we started thinking about this idea and then we uh, we said this has to be technology driven or app driven because that's that's the only way it's, it can scale. Um, um, I think once we thought about it, there was really no looking back. We didn't have any major speed bumps. Uh, we wanted to test it out and validate if this really works. So I think that was our main thing, you know, like a proof of concept. Mm-hmm. Does this really work or uh, would it only work in certain segments of the society? Would this have mass appeal? So these were some questions that we had and we had to get this validation for it. So we started off, we had a, uh, we started off in um, Jan 2017, we built the app. Um, six months, we just kept building the app. So I think our first roadblock was taking so long to build the app. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually companies do it in about three, four months. But then we were glad we took that time because uh, it is a well-built out app if you look at it now. Uh, we thought of uh, a lot of things while we were building the app. And that was our first roadblock. After that, we launched our first farm, kept it really slow. Uh, we launched our first farm in uh, June last year and uh, we experimented with things a little bit and what, what app changes we have to do and all of that. And then I think uh, it uh, it uh, sort of when we got a good positive response from customers mm-hmm. and we validated that uh, idea, I think there was no looking back. Mm-hmm. And what are some basic principles that have guided your business? This could be uh, informal, formal, some sayings you go by. 
So, um, in terms of values, it would be trust. You know, trust, which is at the core of our business, because um, because food, it it boils down to trust at the end of the day. That are you trusting the food from where it's coming? So, we wanted trust to be the essence of everything. So, we are very transparent with our customers. If there's a problem on the farm, say the motor is not working or the uh, or something's conked off, we inform the our customers, you know, beforehand. So, we keep it very transparent and we keep it. Uh, in a sense that this is your farm you sort of own this farm so so it's all transparent i think that's one very important thing um also very um, what we've tried to keep in our office is to have things very easy and flexible and chilled out and not have a very formal uh, sort of atmosphere uh, we have a lot of days when we work from farm for example, uh, we set up uh, a tent, we put some chairs, we work out of the farm. So, so it's a very relaxed, informal kind of atmosphere. And uh, yeah, so these were the things that we sort of wanted to have trust in all levels, not just with our customers, but also with people internally, with our farmers who we partner with. And of course, uh, a relaxed attitude to working. Mm-hmm. Because we all, at the end of the day, want to have fun and want our people to have fun too. So, mm-hmm. and what's something that happened in your to your business that took you by surprise? This could be a big surprise to you, a surprise to others, like your management, your employees, your customers. Mm. Um, I would say, I would say the whole seasonality aspect of things. That is where the fun is in, right? We did think about it, but I think we did not give it enough weightage Mm -hmm. that that this would have such a big impact because because our business is all around growing vegetables and as you know, vegetables have a seasonality and there are months in a year that some vegetables just don't grow. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll have to account for that. We'll have to think of what else to do in these months. Uh, What other vegetables can we grow that would uh, sustain sort of or survive in these months right mm-hmm. because we in the city are used to eating capsicums in summer and because uh, we we can get lychees in uh, you know in summer and stuff like that because these are all flown in for us from different parts mm-hmm. right uh, for example we get potatoes every season in 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 bangalore but the reality is that potatoes in bangalore can be grown only between november and jan uh, whereas the rest of the year the potatoes are coming from Uti or Kodai or one of those colder places so that I think was an aspect that we didn't give enough thought to um, yeah which which now with time uh, we've, we've sort of passed some seasons we've experienced the summer we've experienced rains and winter now so now we know what, what kind of vegetables we, we can grow in what season and what can be done maybe in the rainy seasons to sort of not have that slump in growth Mm -hmm. and what are some past patterns that you believe will repeat themselves this could be in the industry in society or even in the economy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so i think going back to basics right uh, is something that's repeating in so many uh, forms of life that we are seeing Um, going back to eating local um, eating foods that grow in that season or eating eating stuff that you find locally. Uh, so practices in general, we're going back to say, uh, going back to uh, uh, sourcing all your foods from local people or going back to saying no plastics and uh, going to your local Kirana shop to pick up things in a cloth bag. So, so these practices are slowly returning but surely. Also realizing the importance of natural resources, of saving water, of having wells that our parents or our grand grandparents used to have. So, I think the trend that we are seeing overall is uh, going back to our roots, of course. Um, another trend is of uh, is the awareness of going green, mm-hmm. awareness of uh, becoming more eco-friendly because we're seeing uh, so many ways in which it's harming us. Uh, not doing so is harming us. So I think uh, that is something also that we're seeing in so many different areas. Mm -hmm. So yeah, these are the two things that I can think of. Mm -hmm. And what are some things everybody gets wrong about being an entrepreneur? 
uh, so many things. Uh, uh, and in fact, I don't think there is one way that uh, you can be an entrepreneur or you could be a leader. Just like there's no one way to be a leader. There are so many different kinds of leadership uh, uh, styles. In the same way, there are different types of entrepreneurs and different learnings that they get. Um, but uh, what is sort of core to being an entrepreneur is, I think, grit and determination. And what people normally get wrong is that you have to have, what is probably overrated is, is that you have to have passion for the idea. I, yes, you have to have passion for the idea and you have to be passionate about what you're doing end of the day. But I think it's a little overrated sometimes because if you're also too passionate and too attached to the idea, then you get very biased. Mm -hmm. And then you're unable to sort of step back and look at it from a third person's point of view. Mm -hmm. Because for all you know, uh, it might not work or uh, you might have to do some drastic tweaks to your idea. So, so I think for an entrepreneur, it's very important to be able to step out, you know, of your shoes and look at things uh, differently. So uh, I think that quality that people talk about that, no, you have to be very passionate. I think that's a little displaced. Mm -hmm. And in what ways has your business been a collective effort from both inside and outside of the firm? This could be in terms of success, your failures, your learnings. Totally. It's, it's been completely a collective effort. Like uh, to start off with, if you have to start with uh, the founders, we, there are three of us. We bring uh, complementary skills to the table. Um, um, there's a person who takes care of tech, is great at tech. There's somebody who does strategy, I do operations. So we have our role sort of cut out. Um, so those skills are, of course, uh, there and well set. And then we have the team which is so rich and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of, a uh, lot of learnings that come from our team and which we implement um, and also from our customers, right? Uh, a lot of the app changes and app developments and on the farm, the changes that have happened uh, in Farmism, the whole journey of Farmism, I would say more than 60% has been contributed by the uh, by the customers themselves. And they're saying, okay, why can't we do this this way? Or why? So we have to, I think, uh, as founders, as entrepreneurs, it's important to keep our ears open to feedback from these different sources. So I would say Farmism has been like a collective uh, thing, really. It's been, a, a, it, it's from... All the guys, in fact, we learn a lot of things from our delivery boys. Uh, we made a lot of app changes to the whole logistics piece uh, because our delivery boy tells us, listen, uh, they don't pick our phone sometimes, what do we do? Or we go and drop it at their door, what do we do? So it's a constant process of learning and improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in what ways has doing something come back in an unexpected way? Sort of like a concept of corporate karma? Okay, so um, so few things, right? So uh, I don't know if it will answer your question though, but uh, for example, uh, when we started building out the app and stuff, we said, okay, logistics, we'll just partner with the logistics uh, firm and we'll sort of outsource everything to them and we'll uh, use a ready-made sort of uh, route planner and stuff, right? But when we went about doing that, we saw that uh, uh, there were many things that were not available in these ready-made apps. So we did actually build uh, the whole uh, route planning app ourselves. And so we have all that now. And, and it's such a beautiful app, I can't tell you. So it, it plants the whole stuff for you. It, it, everything, the routes are perfect. The drivers find it very easy and riders find it very easy to handle and operate. So few of these um, sort of plugins and things that have devised that have come along the way that we've not really planned for or realized, but they themselves as separate things are, you know, uh, great products mm -hmm. that we could sell and we could, uh, you know, give it out to other people to use. So these are some things uh, that have come about. Uh, from a karma point of view, I think... Uh, we realize that it's so important to eat clean and healthy food, right? Not just for our customers, but also um, also for kids, for 
children growing up who don't have access to these so what we did is uh, we we went to uh, an orphanage and we set up a, a vegetable garden for them all our employees all of us volunteers we asked our customers if they want to come we went there we you know got our hands dirty we dug around we put in vegetables saplings all of that so now there's a thriving garden there and uh, the kids are using this so that's that's a way to give back i think mm-hmm. we're doing but we want to do more of this i think at least set up one such garden every month Uh, and that would be our small way of giving back mm-hmm. and uh, so getting a little more specific why did you even think about becoming an entrepreneur i never thought of becoming an entrepreneur uh, ever uh, you know while growing up so i come from a very middle class uh, family which believes in uh, business is not for us and uh, you know you have to be very street smart for it or you have to sometimes be dishonest uh, we are not cut out for business and uh, my family is all been about uh, they're all into teaching or into public service and all of that so while growing up i never ever thought that i'd be an entrepreneur uh, though i wanted to be good at everything i did so t- when i started out i wasn't even sure about what i wanted to do in life right uh, so every new person i'd meet or a book i'd read or something would make me want to change my career aspirations so i was in that state of mind that i was thinking of different things to do so finally i ended up doing clinical research uh, or consulting for clinical research rather in tcs and i was working for these clinical research companies for a long time for about 12 years so uh, i wanted to be just good at my job and wherever i went i wanted to be the best at it so this happened but this whole seed of being an entrepreneur just came up one day and said um i think i had had enough of the rat race and i want to now go and do something uh of my on my own and see if it works mm-hmm. you know uh so th- that's how it really started i didn't have a, that that's how i started green my life about 4 years back so when i started i was not an expert in gardening i knew a little bit about it but not much but i knew that there was a need for this uh, because i'd gone around asking people like met friends and they would say that you know i wish we had a professional company that manages gardening so i knew that this was an idea that nobody had yet exploited uh, to the maximum so uh, that was there i think it was just about the idea being there and about uh, this this wish to uh, you know go and grab this idea and go and try to see if it works so it all started really there i i don't think it was a planned action on my part mm-hmm. you know and i think there is farmism was yeah a well thought out thing of okay this is what we want to do this is this is our target segment and uh, this is what we want to do i think things were much clearer for farmism when we started out mm-hmm. uh, for green my life it was let me give it a shot and let's see where it goes a maximum it might not work and i'll go back to where go back to probably a tcs or an infosys and uh, as an entrepreneur risk taking is part of your job description how right. do you go about minimizing those risks uh minimizing risks what happen if you plan better mm-hmm. of course uh but not always can you plan for all eventualities because there are these googly balls that just come up and you won't know where they uh, come by uh, but it's basically about planning and also by reading uh, about other entrepreneurs i think i i got a lot of learnings uh, personally uh, when i read a lot of these uh, books of entrepreneurs and their struggles mm-hmm. right and then you could relate to certain things and you say okay this might happen to my business also and i have to be careful of these and also i think to a large extent talking to other entrepreneurs other peers other guys doing other stuff because you learn a lot from others experiences i think uh, and also when you're stuck in something it's easy to uh, you know just give a call or contact and and see uh, see what to do and if they faced a, a situation like that so i think uh, reading uh, has helped a lot uh, listening uh, to them speak uh, also engaging with other entrepreneurs has helped a lot but otherwise all you can do is plan uh, so that your risks are mitigated mm-hmm. 
and also i would say you know when you start off uh, i would say it's better to focus on one thing rather than trying to solve too many problems so uh, solving one problem and that to you know take uh, take a small segment of that problem and then solve that problem first and then once you're comfortable with that and your business is set and it's running and it's sustainable then you could think of adding those other two three problems right so then initially when i started off with green my life we uh, i think i sort of bit more than i could chew and said i want to do this and i want to do that and then you lose focus so then uh, after a year then it dawned on me that we are doing too much and we should just stick to one or two things so i think things are a lot better now mm-hmm. but i wish somebody had told me then when i started out that you know focus on one thing and get that right mm-hmm. and uh, in relation to farmers in how do you acquire the land to do this can you talk to me about the model and is that scalable yeah so uh, when we started out we we were very clear that we wanted this to be a very scalable model right we wanted more and more uh, customers not only customers but also farmers to benefit by this mm-hmm. because farmers get a very raw deal uh, as you would know in in the indian agriculture scene mm-hmm. right so uh, so how we have devised this is really it's like a, a uber for farms if you will right uh, so you have farmers we we don't buy any of their lands we partner with the farmers we get into a revenue share model right so each of these uh, say we partner with a farmer who has say 4 acres of land mm-hmm. right we divide that land up into 600 square feet plots uh, we put a board and a marker saying this is plot a1 plot a2 mm-hmm. of that sort now once we divide it a subscriber a customer then goes ahead and books a plot and he pays a subscription fee of 2500 every month now uh, those are the unit economics now when you uh, the revenue uh, share happens 50 50 between the partner partner farmer and us so end of the month they get 1250 per plot mm-hmm. now if he has 4 acres that means you know in a in an acre you would have about 60 plots <coughs> so in 4 acres he easily have about 60 into 4 uh, 240 plots so he would get 1250 into 240 that's how it overall works so the advantage here is that the farmer gets a fixed amount of money every month his uh, his revenue is not dependent on season his revenue is not dependent on uh, fluctuations in uh, crop prices <coughs> or vegetable prices and he does not have to wait for 3 months for his crop to grow mm-hmm. right right usually uh, in the conventional agriculture uh, how it works is then they invest all the money up front and then they have to wait for the crop to come in and then after 3 months you get the returns right whereas in this method you get money end of the month mm-hmm. so that's how we partner with uh, farmers so but we are very careful uh, about choosing our farmers we want our farmers to be uh, to to value the importance of organic farming uh, we want them to buy in into the idea so we choose our farmers very carefully but uh, economically it's just five times the amount of money that they make otherwise mm-hmm. so it's great for the farmers and for the customers so it's a complete win 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 and it's great for the soil too right mm-hmm. end of the day so uh, so a lot of farmers uh, initially when we pitched the idea to some they were very skeptic about this uh, how how does it work but now when we have these farms growing and we have uh, about eight farms currently running and we see that the neighboring farmers have all started getting interested and they're coming to us and saying we also want to do this um, so yeah there's a, there's more work but there's more returns too mm-hmm. and how do you deal with local problems like a non availability of water or if the local community figures that it's not in their best, best interests so uh, it's very important to sort of integrate with the local community right uh, not not uh, be foreigners to that place and come in and say that i'm going to solve your problems uh, i think what we do is Uh, we uh, we go humble and we say okay please teach us and we are interested in this and how can you help us and how can we help you in turn so that's the approach we really take um, we we see uh, we we really uh, 
engage with the farmers in that area try to understand their problems try to explain our model to them so i think it's about uh, engaging locally mm-hmm. it's about not alienating yourself from uh, from the farmers i think that's that's what's important and there have been uh, you know problems like water not there borewells drying up things like that but uh, but so yeah so we are making farmers aware by by saying how important it is to do rain water harvesting for example how important it is to build a small uh, you know sort of a tank or something where you could store the rain water so these are things that we uh, we tell them in turn and uh, this is how we are really uh, solving these problems of course there are labor issues also in those areas i think the best way it is to have dependable labor coming for you every day is by giving them good wages most of these guys are exploited they are not paid well and in this model there is good uh, you know sort of uh, revenue that's coming in so we pass on that revenue to our labor to uh, we give them good wages and they are happy and they stick to us mm-hmm. and we also tell them how how big a um, role they play uh, by giving you know chemical free food to the customers so so then it's a matter of pride then after that Mm-hmm. And what do you think about vertical farming? Is that a possible future you would be heading towards? Yeah, of course, why not? Because our our cities are getting more crammed, and there's there's some time, there's some day, uh, there's going to be very less availability of space and farmlands, right? Open areas. So yes, vertical farming is definitely something that has to be explored. Uh, however. Um, however right now the vertical models that are there hydroponics or uh, other forms that are there are not completely organic uh, right there is use of chemicals so i would love for a model which which has which is which is an organic vertical gardening mm-hmm. model uh, at the same time saving uh, water saving space and all of that mm-hmm. so by concept uh you know i am thrilled by the idea i think that's the way to go uh and having these small farms within the city you know having uh, uh reducing the amount of time it takes for a food to uh, get to our houses i think that's very important um in fact in bangalore uh, it's an alarming statistic that bangalore is the only city in which food has to travel an average of 100 kilometers which is crazy like so the other cities are all in about 30 km radius 40 km radius that you get most of your stuff from mm-hmm. but bangalore is all uh, 100 km away because of the water problems and all of that so i think reduce vertical farms would reduce that to a large extent right because they use less of water to be within the city and all of that so that's there but yeah something to do with organic may be there mm mm-hmm. And coming to the last question, is there any advice you'd like to give to young people just starting out and trying to figure out what they want to do? So, so it's about uh, it's about finding a great idea. Uh, you'd find a great idea only if you find ten thousand bad ideas. So it's about constantly thinking of different things. but a great idea need not be complicated that's what i've learned it just has to be a very simple and easy to understand idea that solves a, a problem i think that's that's essential also um, also just going out and uh, asking for help you know uh, i think that's that's a quality that many of us probably have forgotten and we say okay i'll just google it and i don't want to go ask someone but i think it's very important to go as people because uh, experiences are not something that you get easily by being at least right so go out there and ask for help if you don't know something just ask uh, and get all the help that you can get when you start up so before you started a business if you have an idea uh, you don't have to keep it locked in and you say you know i'm on stealth mode and i'm not going to reveal this idea to anyone and they might just i i think what's worked for us is just talking about the idea to a whole lot of people mm-hmm. and uh, people have come back and said yeah that's a great idea or they have given us feedback about it and said no, i don't think it's work or this is what you have to do mm-hmm. so i think it's about uh, being free with your idea and uh, taking feedback from people i think that's very important mm-hmm. before you start out 
because once you start out also there's of course the whole journey of learning right but but it's very important not to give up uh, it's, it's important to keep going on i think uh, there've been times when uh, in my earlier startup at least when i wanted to just uh, crawl and weep and that's happened but because there are these ups and downs that uh, come right especially if you're doing a bootstrap business if you're not doing if you're not getting easy funding and all of that of course it's a very difficult journey but the important thing is if you believe in the idea and if you see validation of it the important thing is to just keep going on and not giving up uh, too soon yeah thank you so much ms geetanjali thank you thank you so much anika